Today is the start of a brand new series on this channel, and that is going to be a step-by-step -step guide about how you can become an amateur racing driver. And that's because I went on this journey myself earlier on this year when producing a university documentary. We were only allowed to produce a sort of 30 minute documentary, so we unfortunately didn't get to show all of the ins and outs of this sport. So I have so much footage I haven't actually broadcast out there. So I'm excited to share with you my journey in a bit more detail here on YouTube. So there's going to be about eight to 10 episodes for this series and I'm gonna see every little step along the way. And at the end of this series, we're gonna look back at the race itself and analyze it, which I'm kind of a little bit worried about because I haven't really probably looked at it from the onboard from the whole race. So that's going to be quite interesting. So the big idea here is that in 2020, I'm going to be taking on more amateur races myself and producing a mini documentary for every single race and also including the stuff in between races. So prepping the car, understanding it because I don't have a lot of mechanical background. So I need to understand a lot about the car in terms of making it go quick out on track. So in 2020, you're gonna be seeing a brand new documentary series on this channel every single week. But nonetheless, episode one of how to become a racing driver is understanding the costs. So what I'm going to do is strip this back to the basics and the four main things I can really think of when becoming a racing driver. The license, race wear, the car and the entry fees. Of course all of them do vary quite a bit and all of which are quite expensive but nonetheless I'm going to try and break it down as best as possible and understand how much it could actually end up costing. So before you do anything else, you need to really go out there and get your license if you're serious about competing in motorsport. So that all starts by buying the MSV Go Racing Pack. So that costs around £100, includes a lot of information, a DVD which you'll need for your theory test, and a lot of other information including a couple of discounts in there as well. So that's your first step, go out there and buy your MSV Go Racing Pack. And I'll try to remember, leave a link in the description down below so you can go over there and start your journey. Alongside filling out your license application form and looking at the DVD and everything included in that pack, get your medical done before your license. That's what I'd say, at least. You don't need to do it that way, but that's what I'd recommend you do because you need both of those together to make sure you can send off your license application and get it approved. Without one of those, you're not gonna get approved and you're not gonna be going racing. So you can get your medical done at a GP, which could be for free, or you could also get it done at a racetrack. I personally got mine done at Brands Hatch at the Arts Day, um, a week, I think, or a week or two before my license. I took my medical just to make sure I was all ready to go and dip my license the week later. You can get them done on the same day. MSV do a couple of events where you can get your medical and your arts done on the same day. So that's a good way to save a trip, especially if you're nowhere near a racetrack. But as I mentioned, you can get this done for free at your GP. So, you know, there are ways to save money here, but just basically I'd say maybe just save the time and the effort. Go there and get them done on the same day if you're available to do so. So we're only at the basics here and you could already racked up 150 pounds. So you can see how motorsport is a very expensive hobby to get a part of. So after studying your MSV Go Racing starter pack, it's time to get out there and take your license. There'll be a theory part and also a driving part of that as well, which we'll get on in later videos in more detail. But together, these will cost £270. A couple of the smaller tracks do them at lower rates, so if you want to save some money there, there are some options to do so, but Brands Hatch was by far my closest track, so I decided I'm going to go there and get it done there, especially it's a track I absolutely love. But uh, we'll get onto that in more detail in the future about how that all went about the license day and the ins and outs of all of it, because, you know, it can get to your head. It's quite a lot going on at the same time. That's going to be an extra £270 after everything else we've already mentioned. So something you could do before taking your ARDS license test is getting out there in your own car on a racetrack just to get some prior knowledge of the track. Now personally, I didn't have any knowledge of Brands Hatch bar what I'd sort of driven on games over the previous couple of years. I'd never driven on Brands Hatch in a car beforehand, so the first time I hit Brands Hatch was doing my license test, which is of course quite daunting. So if you have the means to go out there and do a day sort of testing at Brands Hatch or wherever your local circuit is before you take your license, you wanna try and minimize the amount of pressure you're putting yourself under. And of course, I didn't know the breaking points. I didn't know where exactly, you know, turning points and everything like that are. So a lot of that can be sort of understood doing a track day beforehand. So you could put a little bit of budgeting in beforehand to doing a track day in your road car before you go out there and do your license. So if we add this all together, the £100 for the Go Racing starter pack, £50 for a medical, £270 for the actual license itself, 
you could be looking at near enough 500 pounds uh, for the whole thing especially if you throw in some testing in there as well of course as I said already there are ways you can get this cheaper if you go to certain tracks they will do it at lower costs that's one way you can save money and also if you can get your medical done by your GP that's a nice way you can save yourself 50 quid so after that fingers crossed you have passed your odds test and you're ready to go racing and have got your national B race license which is a very exciting moment I do remember the feeling of, I guess it was a relief of passing mine I was like Whew, thank goodness we we did it well I did it I couldn't really believe it at the time but it, you know it, it does take a bit of time to sink in it's quite a nice little moment there it's kind of like passing your driving license test your road test it, it's the same sort of feelings but of course it if you're a race fan it kind of means a little bit more because you're actually can go racing which is pretty exciting so after you finish your R's test it's time to look at racewear in my opinion that's the next thing I think you should be looking at you can see behind me there that's my racing helmet which we'll get onto in a minute but I think a great place and a great time to get out there and try a different race we're on and understand which ones fit the best for you is go to the Autosports International Show each year in the UK in January. It's normally in Birmingham and I think it's a great place that you can try loads of different types of race wear and understand which one is the best one that fits you. So there are quite a lot of things that are mandatory however for a lot of series of course. So you've got the helmet and that's going to need these uh, hand clips here at the back. So I went for a bell, but we'll get onto that in a later video, but a helmet with hands device is something that is mandatory for every single series. Of course, aside from that, you have the hands device. So that's this. Once again, I only got a club level one because that's what I needed, but you can get much more expensive, much lighter. That's one of the things as well. Aside from that, you're going to need a race suit. You're not going to need a, a Williams race suit, but that's one I have got. I have obviously got the one I used in the documentary as well, but this is FIA approved, not just fan merch. This is legit. So you need that, and then you also need some uh, gloves as well. So these are just from Alpine Stars, ones that I've had for a long time. And then you also need the race boots as well. They're downstairs. And I also highly recommend you get the FIA approved underwear, which you wear underneath the suit, because I think personally that's very, very important because, you know, it's just an extra layer of safety that I think at the grand scheme of things you want to have that especially if you are involved in an accident you want to have that extra layer i'm not gonna lie when i first thought about this i was thinking about just getting the cheapest for absolutely everything um so i had this list going to the auto sport show at the start of 2019 of sort of basically all the cheapest items that i wanted to buy just because i wanted to make sure that i wasn't spending too much money because at the end of the day it was a university project and we didn't have loads of money flying about here we were sort of on a, a, a strict enough a budget to get this all going but a few examples, I decided to go for the, the Bell helmet over the cheapest brand. Now, it might sound weird, but you know, you, you can't just buy one off the internet and just hope it fits. I mean, it might fit, but it not, might not fit properly. So, you know, you're probably not going to be able to see it, but inside there is a lot more padding than if you were to get the cheapest one, which was quite basic. In the grand scheme of things, it's probably a bit more expensive. You're going to be spending 100, 150 pounds more on a Bell one rather than one of the cheaper brands, but it's your safety at the end of the day. And let's be honest, you need to make sure you're safe behind the wheel. That's the most important thing. I'll go into all of this in a bit more detail in a future video. As I said, this is going to be a longer series, not just one video here. So I'll tell you why I bought certain products and why I think they're better than the, the cheaper ones, for example. And I think I just need to bring home the point. The Auto Sport Show at the start of January is a very, very great tool uh, to get out there and actually try on loads of different tyres because for you, one of the cheaper helmets might fit properly, but I guess it's my shape head had to fit one of the Bell helmets. I think the Bell helmets and the Arai helmets are quite similar. So if I was to upgrade from the Bell, I might go to an Arai, but you know, different head shapes and different sizes fit the different brands. So you need to go out there and try them all on. You can't just buy one online and hope it fits because, you know, it's your safety at the end of the day. So, if we're looking at all of that sort of stuff there, and if we're looking at buying the mid-range stuff rather than the cheapest stuff, you could easily be spending over a thousand pounds. I mean, if you went budget for absolutely everything, I reckon you probably, you know, you probably could get it for 700, 800 pounds. But if you know, if you're going to spend 200, 300 pounds more to spend just over a thousand pounds on the right equipment, all of stuff that is really probably built I'd say maybe not just skimmed on in some areas and in my opinion if you're gonna look to save money anywhere don't do it on the race wear you'll find somewhere else to save a bit of money but just don't do it on the race wear. at the end of the day it's your life that is trying to save so you can see how this becomes a very expensive hobby before you even stepped into a race car so we're let's say 1500 pounds for race equipment you've got another 500 or so pounds for the license the application and the medical maybe a track day thrown in there as well 
it all adds up pretty quickly. So you know you could be easily spending two thousand pounds before you've even stepped into a race car. But the next point is the car itself. So this is a part that I'm actually going through right now because of course I mentioned at the start of this video I'm going to be competing myself in 2020 and I'm excited to hopefully bring on some people on board with these races as I'm hoping to do endurance races between sort of 45 minutes an hour and a half I'm looking to hopefully bring on a couple of people hopefully within the YouTube space to come alongside me and do a few races so I'm really excited to see that and maybe you can leave a comment down below about who you'd like to see me race alongside that'd be pretty awesome but nonetheless Buy a car is a tough one. Trying to understand one that's going to be good in multiple championships is very tough, unless you're dedicated to one championship. But the problem I have for 2020 is that I'm not going to be able to race in one championship solely because work, as you probably might have realized in one of my recent videos, consists of 22 of the 52 weekends over a year. And unfortunately, motorsport only sort of goes on from Wednesday, the Wednesday? <laughs> from March to November, so that condenses it even further. I don't have that many free weekends to go racing in 2020, so it's gonna be hard for me to race in one sole championship. If you can do so, that's maybe the best way to make sure you've got competitive car in a championship, is because it will be maybe a one-make series, for example, or quite narrowed down about what cars you can actually choose. But for me, I'm looking to find a car that's competitive in multiple championships, and that's proving to be quite tough. Hopefully I'll have an announcement in the next month or so, but we'll see. It's going to be uh, an interesting journey up until that point, and maybe I can bring you on board with what I finally choose very soon. Of course, understand where you want to be racing before you just go out there and buy a car, because you might find it doesn't really go into the sort of championship you want to race in. So do your research first before you're buying a car. But as I said, this is a very unpredictable part of the journey here. It's about how much you're going to be spending on this car. I'm not going to ramble on too much longer, but you, know, you can start off by saying £4,000, around there is probably the cheapest you want to be paying for a car. You can go lower, you can go cheaper, but you've got to understand you're not exactly sure what you're going to be buying at that rate because, of course, that, you know, most sports expensive. And if you're spending very little on the car, you're probably going to have some issues to deal with quite early on. I don't know, am I just tempting fate for when I get a car and it has issues? I don't know. But nonetheless, you're going to be looking to spend at least £4,000 on a car, I'd say. And if you're looking to get a one-make championship car, I mean, if you're looking for something like the Civic Cup, for example, you're looking probably ten to £12,000 for a base. Yeah, you know, TCR, something like that, you're going to be spending £60,000, £70,000 on a car. It really depends what you want to race in, but don't be thinking you're going to be spending much less than £4,000 on a race car. And if you're going to build one up yourself, it's normally a bit more expensive, but you can sort of make your dream car. So maybe that'll be spending six, £7,000 on the same sort of car you could get for £4,000, but at least it's the car you really, really want to get. Also, something to note is that you could do Arrive and Drive. That's what I've done for the two races that I've done so far. Uh, one race I actually completed, uh, but obviously the first one you probably maybe have seen in the documentary didn't go to plan, but nonetheless, both of them were arrive and drive. I paid the money up front. I went in there, drove alongside the co-driver. All was good. Over multiple seasons, it probably works out more expensive. Uh, over one year, it probably works out less because you're not going to be paying pe you know, people for like labor costs in terms of you know what you're going to be getting from a mechanic per day and then understanding what the guys going to be doing back at the workshop bending the car and what sort of stuff it can all add up and I'm, lo <laughs> I'm looking forward to that in 2020 about how much that's going to be uh, but arrive and drive is definitely an option you should be looking out for if you're not 100% sure whether you want to buy a car or you're not really sure what series you want to race in arrive and drive is an option many championships offer many great teams are out there and of course Sam and Chris that I drove with both great guys as well. I think both possibly could be looking for co-drivers in 2020. And maybe I'll leave their contact details down below if you want to get involved with those guys. So to put a final number on buy a car, it's quite tough because, of course, everyone's going to have a different idea about what they want to get. But if we're looking at the lower end of the spectrum, if you go in sort of basic, basic, but still going to get something at least a little bit competitive, I'd say you're going to be wanting to put towards about £6,000 here because you want to buy a car and then you're going to probably want to make a couple of upgrades to make it more suitable to you. So that could be the steering wheel, that could be the seat. Could be a variety of different things, air upgrades, engine upgrades. It's all going to cost money. So I'm going to say £6,000 there or thereabouts for sort of the bottom end of the scale here. And you've got to also consider that certain things have a sell-by date, stuff like the seat, the fire extinguisher, 
many other things, or not many other things, a few other things do have a sell-by date, so you've got to understand you could be buying a car and then the sell-by date of the seat, for example, could be, or is it the seat? Maybe it's the, the harness. You've got to understand you might have to change that straight away. So that's something just watch out for in the listings. They might sort of sneak that one out there. It might be in date for a couple more months. You've also got to consider how you're going to be getting your car to the racetrack. That's also something that could be quite expensive. You could get a car that drives on the racetrack and drives on the road like Sam, uh, McKee Motorsport. He drives his car to every single event and that's one way he sort of saves a little bit of money instead of towing his car around the country because you need to get a towing license and you also need to get a trailer and possibly a car that can tow that trailer. So that could all end up costing you a bit of money as well. But that could be from nothing because you could already have a trailer. You could already have a license. I think licenses over a certain age, you don't need to take a new test. But if you're a bit younger like myself, Myself, I will need to take a, a towing license next year if my car doesn't have uh, road eligibility. So that's going to be something that I could be looking to spend even more money on in 2020. But yeah, just keep an eye out on that because that could be something you might not really think about until it comes to the point where you need to get your car to the racetrack and you're wondering, how am I going to do that? But you could easily be spending maybe at least another £2,000 on the license and a decent trailer uh, to make sure you, you get your car to the races and that's just assuming you've already got a car that can, can tow it. So after you've thought of everything else, you've also got to think about the race entry fees and also the testing fees and everything like that to go along with it because that can all get quite expensive as well, unfortunately. So basically, public t t uh, track days open to anyone. Of course, you can just rock up in your road car, spend 100 to 200 pounds and get your car out on track. So that's a good way to get loads of track time, even a race car. I mean, most track days allow you to race road cars and race cars. There's not really any problem there. There are certain ones that are track day cars only or race cars only. And then there are ones that are road cars only. Of course, you could possibly get around that if your car is actually a road car and a race car at the same time. But maybe you don't. I think the best ones if you want to get practical testing in and ones you want to get actual proper data from and understand the setup are race car only track days because you do end up learning quite a lot more as there aren't so many cars around. Or well, at least that's what I found at Brands Hatch because it's quite a short track. I mean, you're looking at lap times under a minute and you're coming across at least 30 cars possibly on the racetrack, maybe even more than that. Whereas someone like Donington Park, I also tested there a much longer track and you could be looking at somewhere like Silverstone as well and even even longer track. So it really depends on what sort of track you're going to be racing at and where you're going to be doing your testing. Maybe somewhere like Donington or somewhere like Silverstone, you don't need to do a private uh, race car only track day because you're not going to be coming across so many cars. But when you're possibly wanting to get more data at a smaller track, maybe somewhere like Brands Hatch, you want to get that data, possibly go out there and spend that bit more money on a race track day because you're going to be not getting much data if you're coming across a road car every few meters where the driver is only just having a bit of fun and fair enough that's what track days are kind of for but you know if you're trying to get some data from your race car you want to not have these issues and not have the you know the struggles of getting around cars that won't let you pass because they you know not really understanding racing they're just trying to have a bit of fun so maybe spend that bit more money on a race track day a race car track day um maybe for every track but especially for the shorter ones i'd say in my experience at least so after you've considered the cost of testing you've got to think about the cost of the race entry fees now unfortunately for motorsport drivers these are even more expensive than the testing and that's even though you get much less time out on track so you know really think about this do you actually want to do the racing or do you just want to drive your car on a track because you can still prepare your car in a way that you basically just use it as a track car lots of people do that lots of people enjoy it they don't need that competitive edge of going racing but this uh, this series isn't about being a track day driver this is about becoming a race car driver so we're going to get into this so you could spend as little as 250 pounds on race entry fees some of the smaller clubs uh, start off around that level I think the CMM CS, which I raced in my second race in, uh, they, their entry fees are around that. They're on the lower end of the scale, which is great. Obviously, I absolutely love that. Um, but you're looking more realistically at spending probably £350 to £500 on race entry fees. And as I mentioned, this is on the lower end of the scale. We're not looking at professional, semi-professional racing. They're way more money there are, you know you're spending thousands of pounds just on entry fees if you're going professional. But on the amateur side, thankfully, that isn't too extreme but 
you know, if you're thinking, you know, four hundred pounds times six race events over a year. I mean, people might even want to do six, uh, sorry, eight, ten events a year, and obviously that goes even further up. But you know, four hundred pounds times by six. And if you do the same with testing, two hundred pounds times by six, you know, you're looking at over three thousand five hundred pounds just on the entry fees alone for both, which is obviously quite a lot of money you're spending there. So once again, as I'm going to mention quite a lot of times in this video, it's an expensive sport, so just be wary of that. And I'm still thinking about it myself. It's obviously going to be tough next year to make sure this all works out for me, but you know, I'm determined to make it happen. So I want to add all this up now. What does this come to? What could you realistically do a season of motorsport for? Once again, it's club level racing. I know you can get much more than this, but I've tried my best to come up with a, a number at least that you can put into your head and see whether this is realistic for you for a, a year's worth of racing. Let's say you're starting for nothing. £500 for the license. Fingers crossed you p pass it first time. Of course, that can get more expensive. £1,500 for the equipment. And then say you did six races with testing prior to the event. You'll be looking to spend £3,600 on that, assuming the testing is 200 and the race entry fees are 400 Once again, they could be less, but let's use that as a mean figure. So you're going to be looking at spending at least £5,600 for everything above, uh, plus what you're going to be spending on your car and then maintaining it and getting it to the race event. So it definitely wouldn't be unreasonable to be thinking you're going to be spending at least £12,000 in your first season of racing. Of course, it becomes cheaper for the second year because you don't have the upfront costs of buying the equipment doing your license again that's going to save you a couple of thousands of pounds which is, is great but it's still not cheap i mean you could get it down to about eight thousand to ten thousand pounds per year but it's a lot of money to be spending so just make sure you understand the financial side of motorsport because i've had to understand it quite thoroughly this year to make sure my university project worked but we got there in the end but i did one race well Technically two races, but one race I actually drove in. I'm not going to let it go. <laughs> but yeah, I did basically one race. And that was quite expensive because there were quite a lot of one-off costs, like I mentioned already, getting a license and all that sort of stuff, as well as doing the track days that I did and the race events I did as well. It was quite expensive for one or two races. But of course, the more races you do, it sort of averages out a little bit less because you're not getting all those upfront costs like the equipment and the license. So I think it goes without saying, myself as a university student just a couple of months ago, I would have definitely not been able to go on this journey without the support of my sort of Kickstarter backers and great sponsors. Uh, very, forever thankful of those guys because without them, my journey wouldn't have been possible. But now that I am working near enough full time across a few different jobs, it's possible that in 2020 now that I can go on and do more races because, you know, as a university student, you have zero money and uh, going on into the future obviously it's hopefully going to be a little bit better and hopefully I can afford to do more races in in 2020 but yeah I'm forever thankful because they though you know all of those guys really allowed me to live out my dream just for one race and hopefully I'm going to take that further in 2020. So that's it for this video this is probably going to be the longest video in the series because there was so much to speak about but the next video we're going to be speaking about sort of what championships you could be racing on in a club level. I'm going to try and go across as many of the different championships as possible we're going to be looking at circuit racing mainly but of course you could be looking at hill climbs you could be looking at rallying there's a lot of different options that i'm not going to speak about too much because i don't really have the experience in it i don't have much experience in the one i'm speaking about uh, but at least i have a little bit of knowledge about what i had to do to get to the place where i went so um yeah thank you for watching i really am looking forward to 2020 getting out on track and producing a documentary series for this channel it's going to be really really exciting um thank you so much for watching hopefully you enjoyed and uh, please remember to like the video if you enjoyed and subscribe if you are new because that'd be much appreciated so uh, yeah hopefully see you out on track in 2020 possibly but i'll see you in a few days time for the next episode of this series thank you for watching goodbye <laughs>